welcome back to another episode of the ABCs of ERP and Beyond, the podcast all about enterprise resource planning software and how it helps with running a business through a dedicated system. If you're new to the world of ERP and are looking to learn about how it can provide reliable inventory control, accurate bookkeeping, real-time data analytics, amongst other features, well, that's where this podcast comes in. We discuss things like business process best practices, ERP technology, organizational change management, and everything in between. But I couldn't do it without my fellow co-host, Nirav Shah. And Nirav, before we start, I can see that we are joined by a special guest today. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Super excited about our episode today. Um, We do have a special guest, our first one on 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 the podcast, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and today we, with us, we have Chris Harrington. Um, she is Chief Executive Officer of Gen Alpha Technologies, a technology company that enables uh, equipment and aftermarket product growth for OEMs. She's an advocate for manufacturing, uh, recognized as a thought leader in the B2B manufacturing digital transformation space. Her, she's going to share her knowledge with us uh, and her experience through multimedia platforms, including blogs, webinars, and podcasts. Before joining Gen Alpha, uh, Chris worked in leadership roles in sales and aftermarket with uh, Enterpack. Hope I'm saying that name correctly. Uh, Caterpillar, uh, they're, they're right down from me. Uh, uh, Bakerist in, uh, International, her career has spanned positions in the home office as well as regional assignments in all around the world, Canada, Brazil, Peru, including responsibilities with internal stakeholders, dealers, customers to deliver results in the aftermarket original uh, equipment sales space. So Kim, welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for being on our podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, really an honor, Peter and Narav, to be your first guest. I, <laughs> I, I find this to be a privilege and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem at all. And you're like right above me, right? You're in Wisconsin and you're in Chicago. Uh, yes. And then we have Peter in, in, in the UK. So, yeah, uh, way got it all outside, covered. isn't it? Yeah, I'm like 4,000 miles away. So <laughs> We've been speaking about having a special guest for, well, the entire of, entirety of the podcast, I think, probably yeah. from day one when we were initially brainstorming some of the ideas of what we can start speaking about, probably before we even named our podcast yeah like yeah we can have special guests on and then throughout (laughs) all of 2023 we were yeah we'll have to have a special guest and and then we started planning 2024 we were like yeah we need a special guest here we are four (laughs) months on and we only just got around to it so yeah yeah Yeah. well it when uh, narav and i had a chance to speak uh when we first met we both shared that we had a podcast and Given the nature of our two solutions, one being an ERP and the other yeah. being uh, e-commerce and how closely they're related, we just said, hey, we should do this together. So, <laughs> ta-da. And, and yeah. here we are. Exactly. Yeah. And here we That's are. And, and, and Chris, you also do a podcast. So if you want to maybe help uh, you know, our, our listeners also understand a little bit of your podcast that you do. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that. Well, Um, I do a podcast with two other women. It's called a broadcast for manufacturers. And there's a little wink, wink on the broad because it's three broads. We talk about manufacturing. Uh, We have special guests ourselves that, uh, of course, are male and female across the board. Our our podcast is for everyone. And uh, we're really just tackling all of the different issues uh, that manufacturers are facing these days. And it's been... Uh, an incredible joy. We just released our 50th episode this past Wednesday. So um, yes, a milestone. What do they call that? The golden, we've reached the golden uh, point. And uh, we're going to be celebrating our 50th episode with women in manufacturing on May 15th at a winery in Wisconsin. So uh, we're going to be joining the Southeastern Wisconsin Women in Manufacturing to host a live podcast, something we have never done. But yeah, I, I encourage your listeners, um, if they're in the ERP, sp- ERP space and particularly manufacturing, uh, this could be a great show for you just to get uh, a broad swath of ideas and information. 
Wow, that's that, that's fantastic, and thank you for that. I think that's definitely going to be a phenomenal event uh, that you're throwing out there um, for manufacturers and women in manufacturers, especially. Um, in addition to running Gen Alpha, you have a small farm. Um, yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so yeah, you mentioned that I'm from where I live in Wisconsin. So we've got about five and a half acres here in Wisconsin. We have a number of fruit trees. We've got berries planted. We've got chickens and ducks and we do bees and we plant a big garden. In fact, at the end of this month, we'll be planting our garden for the year. Um, we do a lot of tomatoes, peppers, pumpkins, watermelon, herbs. And uh, we have a farm stand that's at the bottom of our property and we share our produce with the community. It's a, they purchase it on the honor system. And I just find it to be an incredible outlet for me, you know, getting your hands dirty in the ground and just uh, putting a seed in and watching it grow is just uh, so masterful. And I really have nothing to do with it, right? Water, <laughs> oxygen, <laughs> air, nature, good yeah. sunshine, <laughs> yeah, and, and things grow. So, and sometimes it's a success and sometimes it's, it's not, but that's just a, a parallel to life, right? Yeah. And I, I have just enjoyed doing it, so. Totally. Wow. That, that, that's great. Uh, and and re really appreciate that insight, uh, Chris, and what keeps you uh, occupied outside of work and the, the you know, digital transformation and everything that's moving so fast in technology around us. Uh, so today we have a great topic to discuss with you. Uh, we want to discuss e-commerce strategies um, for B2B companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, more and more companies are increasing their online presence, as we know, uh, whether it's a retailer, a wholesaler, services organization, a manufacturer, right? Um, I'm a firm believer um, that everyone in some capacity is an online seller, whether they believe it or not, right? You're mm -hmm. going to have a website and that's going to be really your first uh, kind of interaction with your customer uh, ultimately, right? Uh, so Chris, let's get started and let's get your expertise and thoughts around this topic. So the first question I have, Chris, is what are some of the challenges from your standpoint that you've seen B2B organizations face when trying to grow their business online, right? Um, where do you yeah. start there? Yeah, well, let's talk about just some of the challenges to grow because many B2B companies are still not selling online. So uh, I do think online strategies can help solve some of the problems that they're facing and if we kind of just walk through some of those, I think it will point to why, you know, selling online can, can really help. So one of the first things is, uh, you know, that so many organizations, especially in the market that we serve, manufacturers, distributors, they have multiple backend systems. So they have an ERP system, they have a CRM system, which is your uh, customer relationship management system, they have a PIM system, a product information management system. They might have a dealer portal. Uh, so they may be doing some self-service in a dealer portal. But what happens is that these systems are often disparate and not talking to each other. There's no cohesive go-to market strategy. So customers often have confusion of what is the easiest best way to do business with you. And if there's any friction in that buying process, it can be challenging. And um, ultimately, it's not good for employees either because they have to understand where to go for which information. Often they have to log into multiple environments. So you may have a super user in one area and a super user in the ERP system, but another that really knows the CRM system, but they're not getting value from all of them. So that that's one thing. And if you're an organization that has had many acquisitions, you could be multiplying the number of backend systems, right? Now you're talking about multiple ERP systems, multiple locations. Uh, we could even talk about the engineering systems and some of the other systems that hold data that ultimately become important for customers. So the multiple backend systems is, is a challenge uh, in helping customers grow. Uh, or manufacturers, particularly in B2B organizations grow. The other thing I'd say is that many organizations are still using traditional methods for responding to customers, 
which means that they're getting a high volume of emails, phone calls, text messages, some even still faxes today that they have to respond to, which means that they have a difficult time moving from reactive to proactive, right? So they have to respond to what's coming in. They may have multiple, it could be a customer service team, a sales team, a technical support team, all responding to things coming to them, but they never have the opportunity to be proactive, to try to close the gap in new areas of opportunities for sales uh, because they just don't, there's too much coming in and too much coming at them, right? Often we've called that order taking in the past. Um, and, you know, I don't mean mm -hmm. to downgrade any of those activities, but when you are that busy, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to move the business forward. The other thing that I would say that's preventing companies from go, uh, growing is tribal knowledge is leaving the company. And it's at an accelerated rate right now. Uh, I can't remember who said it. I, it's been repeated to me at different conferences that I've been to, but I've heard 10,000 baby boomers are retiring a day right now. And if, uh, if companies, particularly B2B organizations, aren't capturing the knowledge from those people, those people that historically have the information in their head or they use uh, spreadsheets or other types of tools where they know information and, and these organizations aren't capturing it somewhere, somewhere and making it available to everybody, uh, you know, people suffer. But it also creates a workforce constraint in bringing people in. So um, as younger generations enter our workforce, both in B2B organizations and the organizations that we serve, so our customer organizations, our dealer organizations, they're all bringing in that next generation as employees and they are demanding something different. So when we have this combination of things happening, it can be difficult to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And you you bring on a lot of really good, interesting points there because we're noticing as well in the ERP space that the user, the ERP user is becoming younger and our, you know, who, who, we're, who we're training now um, has requirements that weren't traditionally there. They're looking for more automation. They're looking for more, uh, you know, streamlined processes, um, not a lot of the paper and pencil type of activities that were, you know, a lot of a lot of the old school maybe manufacturing uh, uh, processes were, were accustomed to, and and moving up front, uh, we're noticing, you know, the buyer, the the who you're buying from, or 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 who that. Uh, Spire is is younger because they no longer want to talk to a salesperson. They said, "Hey, we want to just go online. We want to place our order, and essentially, if something is wrong, then we'll pick up the phone and call you." Other than that, we want to do this whole thing digitally and not worry about it. Shopify. Actually, is interesting enough. Came off with came out with a uh, specific stat uh, not too long ago. Is that uh, users, buyers, have no issue doing a digital transaction up to fifty thousand dollars. Might be even higher now. But I yeah. mean, you know, if we think about you know where this is trending and you know how organizations need to start looking at what their strategy is because. Is it going to be difficult to go from a traditional sales model to a full e-commerce model? Yeah, it's going to be difficult. We have to do a hybrid model. Most likely you might have to do a hybrid model, but you have to start looking at that now and today because, you know, the, the people are changing. Like you said, the workforce is getting younger and the demand and, and what the, the platforms could do now is just way more than it could ever do before. So, you know, and, and you have to start developing a strategy around that. So I think you hit, a, hit on a lot of really good points in, uh, you know, how to, you know, what are the, some, some of those challenges and then how you could combat some of those challenges when you're growing your business ultimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, you know, that stat that you uh, brought, um, it, you know, $50,000 in orders, we're seeing that online every day in our customer implementations for manufacturers who are selling their equipment and parts online. It's nothing to have a $50,000 order from a customer. And, uh, and, and that's common in the everyday business when it's not online, right? So of course, when you create a digital self-service tool, you're going to see orders of the same magnitude because that's what your customers are doing. They have needs. Uh, and if you make it easy, if it's accurate, they're they're gonna they're gonna use these tools. They are using these tools today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I think also you've got to think about how the data uh, is somewhat different as well from from going from an in-person kind of transaction or even over the phone. Like when it's now all digitalized, it kind of opens the floodgates of data analytics and mm -hmm. the world's your oyster, really, when it becomes so digital heavy. Like before, it might be crunching particular sales data for a particular day. But if you're opening your doors to the world, essentially, and now your customer base isn't technically kind of just regional, it could be international. Say if you've got the opportunity to, to ship internationally, like mm -hmm. the data landscape is very much different from that, from when you are just say a local supplier or a local manufacturer, you're now on a bigger stage. As soon as you open that e-commerce um, channel, you got to think about how am I going to have to really kind of assess my business in a different way? Does that mean I need new KPIs? Do the old KPIs just get flooded? Um, how am I going to start to assess the business and even assess potential markets that I might not have had access to, um, you know, before e e you know you took a, took the step to e-commerce? Yeah. All really good points, Peter. And I, you know, I, I definitely agree that there are a new set of KPIs. Usually the old KPIs are, are still valid. It's just that if we think about a business where we were, let, let's just summarize it in saying order taking, right? It was very easy to run reports out of our ERP system related to our sales and sales performance and who's buying. The beautiful thing about digital commerce is you get to track activity that includes information regarding who's not buying. Uh, what are they looking at and not buying? Who's uh, logging in, but then not purchasing? Um, what products are being abandoned? So there is information that an ERP system, unless you forced every quote or, you know, every phone call into a quote, and then you closed every quote into an order and took uh, really good notes on every line item in that, you just didn't have that data. Now in a digital commerce environment, you have insights that you didn't have before that can point you to customers to focus on, products to focus on. Um, and, and that's a big part of uh, the technology and the benefit for companies is, is having that information at their fingertips. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like this, it's a whole new game to start tracking conversion rates on your website. Um, yes. You know, if you're just order taking uh, and the, mo the, the moment only starts when you receive a PO in the sales inbox, it's already converted to a, to a sale. That's right. So, but there's all of that, that before that, that you'd really yeah. want to dig into, like who is lingering on this particular um, page, mm -hmm. how many clicks is it taking the customer could, to get to where they want to be? How many people are leaving with things in their shopping cart? Mm -hmm. You can't do that if you haven't got that e-commerce side. You may have a website that has all of your products, but then they have to go off and fax you, uh, uh, you know, or phone yeah. you an order. Yeah. So you can't tie those. There's siloed data that you can't marry yeah. up and really get those insights yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. And for me, you know, having run aftermarket parts and sold equipment in my past life as a manufacturer, those were the insights we were seeking, right? Because, you know, when you're an organization that has over a million SKUs, you end up focusing on the things you do sell because that's the thing that you have the information on. So you end up stocking what you sell, you end up pricing appropriately and getting and maximizing your and optimizing your margin on those things that you sell. What you miss is what you're not selling and why. And did you have a product availability when somebody asked and um, they still didn't buy it from you? That might indicate there's a price problem. But if you didn't have availability when they sought that information from you, it could be that product availability was the issue, but you don't have that information. So you're not you're not stocking new products to see if you can improve those conversions with digital commerce, you get these additional insights. And it's it's one thing that I really, really love. And coming from the old school way of selling parts and equipment, um, I would have really enjoyed having these tools. Yeah, no, I, I think they're they're all, all very good points. And, you know, not, not to touch on now, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but 
you know, AI, what does AI do, you know, with all this data and, you know, the customer experience upfront on the e-commerce site, right? And then how it flows on the back end. I think there's a lot of, you know, doors that are going to open in that area as well. Um, moving, moving on to the next question here is how does e-commerce help solve some of the challenges, right, that we talked about? We, we, we discussed a little bit of that. There's some overflow here, but anything there, Chris, that you feel that is important to touch on? Yeah, so if we go back to the the first challenge that I mentioned where there were disparate systems, you know, an e-commerce environment often is designed, certainly Equip360, our solution is designed to integrate to those back-end systems so that it creates a seamless experience for your customers. Um, and often it's not just your customers who are leveraging these tools, it's also your employees. Again, your sales team who's on the road and needs to access information about the customer that they're going to visit. They can have that on their smartphone, um, log in, uh, see the customers that they're going to, con uh, going to reach and look at information, both analytics, uh, open quotations, the order history. They can see if they've been buying online, not buying online. So it creates a strategic conversation for them to be more proactive. So also that reactive to proactive uh, challenge that I mentioned, a beautiful thing about digital self-service is often you have banners, you have featured products, you can share information. Maybe you have, uh, who doesn't have this dead stock, right? Aged inventory that they're trying to get rid of. So if you've got aged inventory out in your warehouse, uh, or in the graveyard, which we used to call it for some products, right? And it's in your ERP system and you're trying to sell it. You could create a section for that aged inventory. And when your customers are frequently logging in with their customer account, they're going to see that information. Maybe they don't even see you as a provider of certain industry parts. So uh, again, in our world, if somebody is coming because they need a, a, to do some maintenance on a piece of equipment, so they're looking for the exact parts, but that company may also sell uh, consumables or industry accessories that the customer often didn't even think of that manufacturer for. Uh, e-commerce site is a great way to promote that. You can have coupons and other things that directly go to your customer's inbox to make them aware and then drive traffic back to your uh, self-service area for customers to have this new awareness. All those things were very difficult to do over the phone. And then when we talk about that tribal, tribal knowledge exiting the company, um, a digital commerce platform is a great way to start capturing that information before people leave. They can help you. You know, one thing I know about uh, leaders who are exiting, typically, especially the ones who have been very loyal for a very long time, they want to leave an organization better than they found it. And they want to see you be successful. So if you demonstrate to them how you could capture their knowledge to be used by others, um, they're usually going to support doing that. So, uh, and of course, you know, mentioning that the, the, the younger generation is coming into the workforce, they are the team and, and the people that want to be buying online. They want to be researching online. So um, I would certainly say the traditional ways of doing business are not gone. You still have to have people who pick up a phone. You still have to do relationship management things. But if you want to ensure your livelihood as an organization into the future, you also have to meet the growing demand of digital self-service, which yep. often simply is B2B e-commerce. Yeah, to totally. I, I have an example, actually, a customer of ours just recently uh, we're, we're, we're implementing Acumatica and we're, and we're kind of connecting their e-commerce site and they have sure. a WooCommerce site. And they, they, they do something really interesting. When they go out to a, um, uh, let's say, a conference or they have a booth somewhere, they raise an e-commerce website just for the event. And they have people, because they have special pricing for those customers that come by their booth, and they have them go to a special website and order directly from there. From that site, oh. and they and and they go ahead and you know they, they activate the site twice a year, and they get you know sixty percent of their business directly through that site, and then they have a public site uh, that's still active, right? But they only activate yeah. this when they do these uh, expos and these booths, which has been really 
uh, great for them because they don't have to take a lot of product with them at that point, right? They could have mm -hmm. uh, people buy directly off the website, right in the terminal, right when they're at the at the show, get the orders in and move on with their day. I thought I thought that was pretty pretty interesting use case from an e-commerce perspective. Oh, that's brilliant! I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's pretty nice, and like you said, right? That helps solve challenges, right? Um, and e-commerce is designed to do that, right? How do we get more product to people faster? You know, and this is this is this is a great example. Um, the, an, another question, kind of to pig, piggyback off of that one, is you talked about e-commerce readiness. Uh, how do businesses know they're ready or get themselves ready to implement e-commerce? Right? Talk to us some about the, about some of the basics uh, that needs to be in place um, uh, with an e-commerce side. Um, that that's best practice, right? That people should always look at. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think this one's critical for helping organizations understand if they're ready or how they can get themselves ready. So the first one that is really, really critical to a, a good e-commerce experience and automating many of the activities that happen when selling your products is to make sure that you have a robust ERP system that has the ability to integrate to other solutions. So um, I would say often this is a basic requirement. Now, um, it's not a necessity to have an ERP system that can fully integrate as long as you have good backend system processes and your information is in the system because there are ways Technolo technologically that we can work around the integration and you could upgrade your ERP system later. But I will tell you that most of the manufacturing organizations that we work with upgrade their ERP system first and then they contact us because for whatever reason, their ERP system isn't ready to make those natural integrations that are needed to pass customer master data, item master data, uh, which includes price, product availability, um, shipping information, uh, and, and all the, you know, the other details that are needed. So having a good ERP system that your organization is using as the safe source is, is really uh, a priority. And I will say most of the companies that we work with, that's what they're doing. So they often think they're not ready for e-commerce when they've been using an ERP system for years and years and years and years, right? Yeah. So yeah. they they are ready. Um, they just need to, to continue. So that's one. The second one, uh, I don't often hear people talk about, but I, I want to mention it because I think it's really important in the experiences that we have working with organizations is that you need to define the audience that you're going after when you implement the, the digital commerce yep. environment. You know, some organizations, they really just want to make it easier for their dealers or distributors or partners to do business with them. If that's your goal, the requirements you have for launching that first step digital commerce may be different than if you're trying to sell to the public. And a common mistake that people make is they think e-commerce means I'm selling all my products to everyone. Uh, sure, in retail, often that is what e-commerce is. But in the B2B e-commerce space, you know, a lot of what is sold through self-service is behind an authenticated login where it's you're selling to a customer. It could be a customer portal. You're selling to a dealer, uh, your, your distribution network. Um, behind a uh, distributor login, right? Um, now, there are also those that do a mix of both. So they are trying to grow their business direct, but also leverage their distribution channel and uh, allow their distribution network to still benefit from all the relationships that they've made in their local um, area. So um, really knowing your audience, helps define the requirements and potentially the type of information that you have. I will say that adoption for customers and distributors when you do something like a portal is typically very high. When you, uh, because that's the way they're already doing business with you. They buy your products from you. You have an account. As long as you allow them to purchase on account when they come in, they're going to adopt these solutions. When you sell direct, Growing business direct 
is the more challenging, uh, you know, opportunity, but it is just that it's an opportunity. So for many organizations that are trying to increase their market share, opening something up direct can be a really good way to, to grow. Um, data. So I can't not talk about data because everybody talks about data challenges uh, from a readiness perspective, right? So when we talk about um, good product descriptions, uh, product images. Now, I will argue, particularly in my space, because I work with equipment and parts uh, organizations, oftentimes images do exist. They're just in 2D or 3D format. That is a great image, at least to kick off your website. So in your engineering files, you have a lot of data, a lot of images. And for most organizations, you also stock your highest turning items. So hiring an intern to take images of what's in your warehouse is gonna get you very close, if not tackling the 80-20 rule, capturing the 20% of products that make up 80% of your business because you've got it in stock. So start with those, get your data analytics from a website, and then go after better data quality for the additional items. But you got to start somewhere. And often people will not start. They won't think they're ready because of their data. And this is where I would challenge them. If people are buying from you today and they're not seeing that data, what information would they need to securely buy from you? It's very different in B2B e-commerce than in retail. Yes, I might want 15 images of a pair of shoes before I buy a pair of shoes online, right? But when it comes to buying an oil filter or an oil change kit for my ATV that's in my garage, I just want to be able to say, does this oil change kit fit my model? And is it a genuine manufactured recommended oil change kit? If those two things are qualified for me, I'm going to buy it. I don't even need to see a picture of it. Yeah. And this is very, very true in manufacturing. So don't get overcome with data thinking my data is too messy. It's not organized. Sure. It, you just have to think about where all your data exists and make sure that you're working with a, a company that can access the data in all the places where it does exist. And then the, the last thing I'll just mention it, for readiness is you have to offer customer pricing online. So for customers who have contract pricing with you, again, whether that's your distribution network, your direct customers, whomever it is, if they have a contract with you and they buy on terms, they need to be able to buy on those terms and see their pricing. Otherwise you will dissatisfy them and they will not use your digital commerce environment. And secondarily, you need to show product availability. Product availability sells in the B2B world. If you don't have it, I can easily Google search and try to find a company who does have it. So uh, showing, pro and I often say availability sells over price. Sometimes you can maximize or again, optimize your margin if you have it on hand over uh, an alternative provider. So um, readiness to me, if you're doing those things decent, uh, you know, price and availability have to be there. A good ERP system is important. You know, uh, images, descriptions, you can build into that, especially if you have a lot of SKUs. But start with the focused area and build from there. I was going to say, what's stopping everyone doing this? Because, like, you sold me. Say I'm a, a typical <laughs> ABC of uh, ERP and Beyond podcast listener, uh, yeah. dedicated subscriber, and I'm listening to you and my business is on a shining ERP. We're using it fully. Um, our data is good. Why am I not doing this tomorrow? Why is we still got so many companies that um, are still kind of lagging behind the e-commerce e space? Yeah, I, you know, that is such a great question. And um, if we could get into the psyche of everybody, that would be wonderful to just try to help give them confidence. But, you know, we have a lot of leaders who have successfully built their careers and built their organizations on different ways of doing business. And, and they will often refer to it as relationship selling. My customers want a relationship with me. They are, uh, they want a relationship with my employees, uh, you know, a, a digital commerce 
uh, site isn't what my customers are asking for. And they, they strongly believe that. Um, I would argue that your customers don't want an oil change. They don't want to build a relationship with you for your oil change kit, right? They want to build a relationship when they're buying that next ATV and they have questions and they want to understand what its features and benefits are over the current one that they own, right? So there are times when they want that relationship, um, but there are certainly a lot of things in the B2B space, uh, copies of invoices, right? shipping status. I don't want my relationship with you to have to be that I got to call you and talk to John, who's going to ask me about a few things when I've got all these requisitions to fill, right? Uh, I don't want to talk about the weather. I just want to know when my product's going to arrive because somebody in the um, in the shop is asking for things. So uh, leadership is still not fully realizing that this is the way uh, things have changed. Uh, and they're not driving it from the top because these um, products become very successful or in an organization when leadership believes in it and they drive it from the top. So we still have this transition from leadership. I will also say that there are a lot of companies who think their data is not ready. They just are overcome. They think that uh, there's no way because they see an Amazon, right, where we're all doing business in an Amazon and they think that their site has to look like an Amazon site. But it's very different in a B2B space. You have to give the right information to the buyer uh, when they need it because they're not browsing. They're buying the things that they need for their job. You're removing friction and giving them the information, even just the ability to reorder products that they've already bought from you. Those orders exist in your ERP system. Uh, sharing that order with them and giving them the ability to reorder line, uh, items there, that's an easy win. And how many of your uh, audience members out there get phone calls, emails for what did I quote, uh, what did you quote me or did I buy three months ago, right? And can you requote me that? And it just, it's churn, it's churn for everyone. So, um, Data not being ready, I would challenge that. Uh, but there are a lot of organizations that, that think it's not ready. The other thing is that there's, there's a misperception that an e-commerce implementation is similar to an ERP implementation, both in time and money. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true, right? Um, uh, e-commerce sites launch much faster than ERP projects. They don't require the same, uh, they still need a cross-functional team. You still need people who get behind it. You need influencers who are making sure that it is the best experience for that customer base that you're going to roll it out to. But it doesn't, it's not as demanding as an ERP implementation. It doesn't take as long and is, it's not as expensive. So um, if we can overcome some of those misperceptions, I think more uh, leaders will move in this direction. And, you know, the reality is they're going to have to. Yeah, yeah I think there's some legacy mindset as well with maybe you, you, you're a company, you're a B2B company, and you don't, you've captured your market, you have your customers, they're repeat customers buying infrequent large volume orders. Um, why would I want an e-commerce site when I don't want any more customers? That seems right. like a legacy mindset, but what I'm hearing is that it's not the same. E-commerce isn't just retail, sell as much of everything to everyone all the time. It's making a relationship frictionless between your supporting mm -hmm. customers you already have who might not, they might hate the fact that every single time they've got to order from you, They've got to go into their office. They've got to type an email out to you and then send it off. There's probably people there like, I wish I could just pull my phone out of my pocket, go on that, that, that. The same order I give you once a month. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to hear. I've never really thought about, um, I've always thought about e-commerce in terms of a retail space. It's interesting to hear how much uh, benefit it can bring to, a, to the B2B space. I've never really considered some of those points. Yeah. Yeah. Consider the convenience, right? Um, we were, we kind of live in a 24, seven, 365, 
uh, your world these days and everybody's kind of on and we all have our smartphones next to us. And, you know, if it, again, if a piece of equipment goes down on the weekend, that's a lot of phone calls to try to get to the right person in an organization to get the parts ordered so that that equipment can get back up and running. But if they could log into their account, see their bills of materials for the piece of equipment, identify the part, get it on order, that person's even their weekend is better, right? Because they know that they've taken care of the thing that is most urgent right now. And you made it frictionless because you gave them access to do that. And, and that's really what we're talking about here uh, is make, you know, removing the obstacles in doing business with you and creating convenience so that your customer's job is easier. So where do we start? Where do these B2B organizations start down this e-commerce journey if they haven't even yeah. considered it? Well, you know, I I always like to say it's important to understand your requirements for a e-commerce solution, particularly a B2B e-commerce solution. But I found when I tell people to start with their requirements, many organizations, especially if they've never done digital commerce, they don't even know what that means because they've never done it. So they don't even know what could my requirements be. So that's where I would say, go on an exploratory phase, call on different vendors who are specialized in your area of business and have them come in and demonstrate. And of course, they don't have to come in physically anymore. We can do the, these types of things over Zoom and uh, Teams, and but let them demonstrate their solutions so that you can see and, and begin to identify the ways that these solutions solve problems from, for you and for your customers. And then from there, develop a list of requirements, share those requirements back with the organizations that you would like to work with and get your proposals. I would say bring uh, you know influencers across your sales, your customer support, your IT uh, and your accounting uh, you know, finance area, because often those are the key business leaders who are going to be making decisions about the site. Marketing is another, I didn't include them, but marketing plays a key role because if you have the influencers in the organization as part of the selection process, the project, they become the people who will uh, really vocalize it internally and they'll get the adoption, uh, you know, the benefit of any solution comes with adoption and it's true for an ERP system as well. If you don't have the right people that you're training and they don't go out and train others or vocalize how to do things and communicate well, then all of a sudden manual processes start happening again and things happen outside of the system, right? But to get the benefit from a digital commerce platform, you have to have people using it. So bring people in who you know are going to add value to the project. They're going to make sure that the requirements are right for the business. But then afterwards, they're going to help you ensure that there's adoption of the solution as well. So um, those would be some of the keys uh, that I would just mention briefly here in the podcast. Yeah, and that's interesting because then you kind of start to play into some of the, the change management side of things. And uh, Nirav, do you want to weigh in on this? Because it's a little bit different, I think, because when you think of an ERP implementation, a lot of the change management is internal, isn't it? It's As, as, oh, as you yeah. said, it's the heart transplant of the yeah, business. Yeah. Um, and you might test with one or two customers, but with, a, with an e-commerce, it sounds like change management weighs a little bit more on, uh, on end customers. So... How do you see this from an ERP standpoint for first steps of a of an e-commerce implementation? Yeah, I think you know it's it's super critical right on each side because you're changing technology. You each have to change people's mindset and thought process for sure. Um, on the ERP side, I think it's a little bit more manageable because you're still dealing with existing 
business processes is existing, right? Uh, people, um, you know, you need to get from point A to point B, right? You got to get from sales order to shipping to invoicing, all that in between, right? There's fundamentally some some very common processes you need to follow, right? But then there's going to be some regulatory issues. There might be some specific customer requirements, compliance requirements that we're going to adapt to on the ERP implementation, which is all going to be part of change management. But change management on the e-commerce side, I think is a little bit more, uh, I think, unknown until you start the project because you have to really understand your customer's capability, right? What are they used to, right? Um, and then you're going to get influence from other customers saying, hey, since you're starting this project, right, why don't you also do X, Y, and Z because it's going to help us, right? Now, right, now you start getting into that, okay, you're getting all these other requirements, but which ones do you do now versus which ones do you wait until later on, right? So I think that becomes a little tricky. But I think as Chris rightly pointed out, if you implement your ERP first and you have a stable platform, you have a stable foundation, right? And you start building up your e-commerce strategy from that point, making sure you have, you know, good inventory numbers out there, right? Making sure you're seeking the right products. You have good images. You're, you know, when orders come in from the e-commerce standpoint, they come in as sales orders and they get fulfilled timely. It, it respects the delivery dates that were set on the e-commerce side. You send the tracking information back to the customer, right? Customer gets an invoice. How are you doing payment processing? If you could get all that nailed down and it should be kind of an evolving stage, right? You should have a plan, I feel like, for what e-commerce phase one looks like, then what does e-commerce phase two look like? But then, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about here, change management on the e-commerce side, on the ERP side, but then what about dipping your toe into selling on different omni channels, like maybe eBay or maybe Etsy or, you know, these other platforms where if you're not ready fully to build that web store, connected to your yeah. website, but you're now want you to tip your toes into selling online, what's the right platform selling online, right? Where are your competitors selling and finding customers, right? Doing that research. Like, for example, I found eBay, you know, just recently I heard eBay is like the go-to marketplace for automotive parts. And I had no yeah. idea about that, right? <laughs> and, and, yeah. and you have to kind of do that industry search. It's like, where else do we also sell? Because once you sell online, it's about data. And it's about where are you going to find that customers? How are you going to scale? And you have all these other revenue opportunities once you start, you know, um, um, building out that strategy. Yeah. That's really interesting you say that just uh, quickly yeah. about eBay because my car, there was a, a, a valve that had gone in it. It's, uh, the valve started sticking. So I went to a dealership who said yeah. what it was. And it's going to be like $150 for this valve or something. It's going to take eight weeks. Yeah. So yeah. I thought, well, let me just see if I can find it. I didn't buy it there. Went home, went to eBay, found it exactly the same OEM part, a Bosch mm. part from Germany. It was about yeah. $60, the same thing, wow. and it arrived in a week yeah. <laughs> on eBay. Yeah. So I probably yeah. contributed to that to that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's it's such a prime example of how we're doing, how we're buying things today, right? If we think something might be high, we have the ability because of technology to at least search and find uh, and determine if we want to purchase it elsewhere. But if you're not even offering anywhere on any channel, then you're out of that mix, uh, you know, yeah. so out of the mix and almost out of business. I don't know, but I'm, That's I really good. feel like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really feel like either you have to get on the e-commerce train sooner yes. than later. You can't wait too long. And, uh, you know, your competitor is doing it. They've already probably started thinking about it. They have some plans in motion. And, you know, this should be a conversation for weekly meetings and cadences to get some, some lift off some sort of strategy uh, for, for companies. Because I, like I said, when we started the podcast, I think everyone is an online seller. Whether they believe it or not, everyone is an online seller. Yeah, I, I like the way you, you say that. Um, and I have to tell you that I downloaded a report, Peter, this might even be interesting to you because uh, there was a survey done in the EU in the UK, uh, and it was done by the B2B e-commerce association. So there's a report online. If you look it up, you'll find it's a 2024 report. So it's very relevant. But they, they say 93% of B2B buyers prefer e-commerce for procurement. They prefer it. It doesn't mean that they get to do it because not everybody's doing it, but 93% prefer it. 98% of buyers face challenges with online checkouts. So 
pay attention to the checkout process. And the report yeah. does a good job saying some of the obstacles. And the great thing is a company like Gen Alpha, we've already solved those, right? So, yeah. and there there are other organizations that have solved for those. It's probably because we don't like talking to each other. I think it's probably <laughs> yeah. that. Or maybe that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here's another one. 79% of buyers say payment terms are crucial for success. So giving the ability to pay on account and having those payment terms, 30 day, 60 day, yep. 90 day, whatever you have an agreement with them, they want yeah. to utilize their cash in other areas. So buying online through their account is really what they're looking for. And then 83% of buyers will abandon an e-commerce purchase without payment terms. So, um, I mean, this report is really wow. good. In fact, wow. those are just highlights, but I found some of the information inside the report even more revealing. So uh, have your audience check it out. I would just leave them for sure with the message that this isn't something that is coming. It is here. And we all have to start moving in the direction of identifying what we are comfortable doing online and take a step. And you, you never really solve your data problems. You never really identify fully any integration challenges until you have a project that reveals the things that help you set your priorities to do the right things first. So uh, if, you, if you don't even get started, you just get stuck in what you're not doing or what you don't have, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't help. Um, so we've, we've all got to get here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Th this has been so fantastic for me, Chris. Uh, I've learned a lot today. Uh, and thank you so much for, um, you know, bringing all these different issues and tips and tricks to light. And I think, I think there's a lot of actionable steps here that we hope that our, our viewers and listeners will, will, will take on right away. Thank you guys for having me on yeah. and uh, being your first guest. It really yeah. is an honor. So thank you so yeah, much. For sure. For sure. Where could, where could, where could everybody reach you, Chris? Where yes. Could, could so you? you can, you can find us at genalpha.com. So that's G E N A L P H A.com. Uh, or I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Chris, uh, Christina with a K, Christina Harrington. Uh, you'll find me, please connect with me. I share a lot of resources. Um, I really love to educate in this space. I call myself more often the chief evangelist. Uh, than anything else, because we're, we all still are learning, including myself, um, uh, when it comes to digital transformation. Thank you very much today. Uh, it's been fantastic. We've learned um, navigating the world of e-commerce uh, in the B2B landscape comes with a lot of challenges, but there's a lot of opportunities for growth and especially efficiency. So it's been really interesting to hear of the things that we need to kind of ponder on, um, issues such as disparate systems, tribal knowledge, 10,000 um, baby boomers retiring per day. Like how do we kind of chat, how do we start to solve some of these issues uh, and identify readiness for e-commerce? So um, everyone listening, if you're a manufacturer, a wholesaler or a service provider, well, the online realm is um, obviously increasingly vital for business success and as uh, Narav has said, everyone is an online seller, whether you realize it or not. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and it's something you want to embark on, uh, on an e-commerce journey, then we'll take heed of uh, Chris's advice. Start preparing now, um, assess your readiness uh, and reach out. So all of our contact details um, will be there. We'll link also to that report if you can send that over to us, Chris. So we'll put that yes. into the show notes as well. Um, and yeah, it's uh, been really eye opening. There's some lots of things that I'll have to digest when I'm uh, editing this podcast down as well. So, uh, so thank you for that. And um, to everyone, stay tuned for more engaging discussions on ERP and e-commerce and how all these bits and pieces kind of link together and, and help your business succeed. So uh, signing off with... Um, lots of things to ponder about um narav it's been a pleasure we should definitely do this again we've finally done it 
we finally had a special guest on uh, yeah. and yeah i'm just sitting here thinking we should have done this months ago uh, it's been a blast <laughs> to have have more than just us two banging on about erp so yeah yeah it's been great and chris thank you so much appreciate it you're welcome thank you for the opportunity cool until next time thanks everyone. all right thank you bye-bye